I know you've been looking forward to this for months, Mike. I have too. I'm very excited to introduce our keynote speaker of the ISVA Sous Vide Summit 2021. He is a world-renowned broadcaster, food writer, speaker, author, and cook who has dedicated the second half of his time on this planet to fulfill his ambition to go everywhere, eat everything. It's a journey that's taken him to all 50 states and to dozens of countries around the world. He is currently the restaurant critic for Time Out Los Angeles and has written hundreds of articles for outlets such as The Guardian, FoodNetwork.com, The Times of London, and Saute Magazine. He's also written three books, Eat My Globe, Eating for Britain, and Fed White and Blue. He's also a well-recognized television personality, regularly appearing on shows such as Guy Fieri's Tournament of Champions, Iron Chef America, Supermarket Steaks, Guy's Grocery Games, Cutthroat Kitchen, Beat Bobby Flay, Cooks vs. Cons, The Next Iron Chef, The Best Thing I Ever Ate, and Eat, The Story of Food. Maybe you've heard of one or two of those. I know they're pretty obscure things that most food lovers would never have heard of. <laughs> He's also the creator, writer, and host of the hit food history podcast, Eat My Globe, Things You Didn't Know You Didn't Know About Food, which is produced in cooperation with the UCLA Department of History. The sixth season will begin in April or began in April of this year. So make sure you check it out. And please help me welcome to the stage, the food writer and broadcaster, Simon Majumdar. I think you're muted there, Simon. Uh, you're currently muted. Should be better than this. As, as, a, as a broadcaster, I should be better than this. So hello, everybody. Um, as I was saying, it's, it, it's such a privilege for me to be invited to do this because sous vide is something at which I'm very new and I'm learning from you guys all the time. So. Um, what I thought I would come and do today is talk to you about some of my adventures, kind of how I got to do what I do on the Food Network, because that's quite an interesting story and, and some of the aspects of that, because that informed what I'm going to talk to you about uh, during this presentation. And what that is, is really to look at some of the dishes that I found on my travels around the world and share that. Now, before I go on, I have to say that, I'm, first of all, I'm wearing my chef's coat, not just because I want to look professional for you lovely folks out there, but I'm actually cooking a dinner. I'm in Lafayette, Indiana now, and I'm in a house where I can't figure out how to turn off the fan, even though I've played with every switch. And I have to also apologize that if there's a sounds in the background, it's the mellow jazz stylings of Miles Davis, and I can't figure out how I can get them to turn that down either. So if you hear a little bit of a soundtrack to my talk, you'll just have to bear with me. Anyway. So what I uh, wanted to do, and I will go to my presentation and just share with you what I do and talk about that as well. Maybe I should change it, though, and do a whole uh, presentation on clear ice, because that sounds rather exciting as well. I heard that earlier. So I'm going to start sharing my screens. I'm hoping this will share. Here we go. So... What I wanted to do is just tell you a little bit about who I am and where I come from, because my interest and my kind of arrival in doing what I do for the Food Network, amongst other things, but most people here will probably know me from the Food Network, is that I come from a totally different background. And, you know, my background wasn't a food background. And originally, I actually trained as an Anglican priest. I actually trained as an Episcopalian minister. Uh, they decided pretty quickly that they didn't want me to do that. And I ended up then working in book publishing. And it was when I was doing book publishing that I really found out that I worked with uh, a lot of chefs. I did a lot of very famous cookbooks with a lot of people in the UK. And that's when I ended up spending a lot of time in kitchens, learning how to cook, you know, and building up a kind of my culinary information. So really, my culinary school was mentoring with some of the best chefs in the world. Um, I wrote my first book, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But I just tell you some of the things that, you know, and a lot of it, obviously, Jason mentioned uh, in my introduction, and thank you to Mike and Jason for in, uh, inviting me to come and do this with you. Uh, so as they said, a lot of what I do and a lot of how you guys will know me is some of my stories and my appearances on TV. I actually started the very first show I did dozen plus years ago now 
was Iron Chef America. So that was the first show next to Iron Chef where we chose the new Iron Chef. And here you can see me with the chairman uh, and you can see me on the right. That was actually the first time that I actually competed on Iron Chef. So Morimoto and I competed against Bobby and Anthony Anderson, who you will know from Blackish and a number of other shows. And uh, Bobby doesn't like to be reminded of it, but we won. So I am one and zero against Bobby Flay, and he doesn't like to lose. So uh, I, I like to have this picture every now and again and flash it in front of him. Uh, this is the show that I'm doing most recently. A lot of people will be watching this. This is, I think, was the highest rated show on Food Network in the last two seasons. Uh, we've done two seasons of this now, Tournament of Champions. If you haven't seen it, do get a chance to go and watch the old episodes. So this is where we have 16 chefs from the East and the West. We do it kind of March Madness style. We get down to the uh, champion of the East, the champion of the West. They fight each other, and then we have the winners. If I won't mention any of the people who've won so far because uh, it'll ruin the surprise. But if you go watch it, I will say this is, for me, the best cooking competition I've ever been involved with in terms of the quality of the food, even better than Iron Chef. It's genuinely extraordinary. So if you haven't watched it, and so my job in a Tournament of Champions is as the color commentator. So basically, I stand with the chefs. They tell me what they're making. I ask them questions I, from my kind of culinary background. And then it's my job to tell the judges. So it's completely blind judging. I basically describe the dish to the judges. And then they make a comment on it based on my description of what the chefs have done. So from that position, it's, it's quite a kind of important position for the chefs to tell me what they do. I love this show. I love working with Guy. I just think and we'll talk about Guy's Groceries in a moment. Uh, I just think he's uh, one of the most extraordinary people, and particularly in the food business. Uh, in the last year and a half, Guy has raised over $30 million for people in the food industry. So for me to be part of that family is really special. And similarly, with Guy's Grocery Games, where I judge and compete. Uh, and uh, for those of you who know and have ever been or seen Guy's Grocery Games, that's a complete supermarket that they build there. Uh, it's not a studio set. That is a complete supermarket that they build. And so there's no waste there. The, the one thing I always tell people when I do Guy's Grocery Games, it's partly done so that so much food goes to all the local food banks. And so there's a big kind of program out there to help any of the hungry out there, which we should all be doing. And this is the show that I probably get stopped about in the street most of all, Cutthroat Kitchen. I'm there with one of my closest friends, Alton Brown, who everyone I suspect who's interesting in, interested in food, particularly sous vide, will know because I know Alton is a big fan of sous vide. And Cutthroat Kitchen, we actually stopped making it about three years ago. I think they're trying to do a reboot now, uh, but I still get stopped. Um, I got it yesterday when we were driving up from Indianapolis up to here in uh, Lafayette. We got stopped when we, I went into a petrol station to get some gas and immediately I got stopped because they saw me on Cutthroat Kitchen. Um, the other thing that Jason mentioned, and this really does inform what I do, I wrote books. So about 15 years ago, I quit my job as a book publisher and decided I was going to, to go around the world and eat. Um, I went to 31 countries in a year, which uh, was a lot of places to go to in a year. I'm not sure I could do it now at my age, um, but basically to eat. So it was everywhere from South Africa to Mongolia to Iceland to, uh, gosh, uh, to, you know, all the way through Austin, New Zealand, all the way around the world, but writing about what I found to eat. Well, and what I've found are so many incredible dishes, and I've brought that into my kind of sous vide story. I wrote a book about eating for Britain. No laughing out there. If there's any of you laughing, I can hear you. Behave yourself. Uh, but it was actually a great book trying to discover the great British menu. So finding the original places where they sold fish and chips, the original places where they were making beer in Britain back in the 800s. So it was a great journey. But most importantly, I think this last book, Fed White and Blue. I'm an American citizen now. I've been an American citizen for six years. And uh, before I went out on the road uh, to become an American citizen, I invited everybody from uh, the United States to come and invite me to share their food experiences. Uh, it turned out to be the most amazing adventure. You know, so I did everything from picking grapes in California. My most interesting call was I got a call from someone with a, a little bit of a Southern accent. And he said, I, I need you, I'd like you rather to come and cook for my team. And I said, well, what, what team is this? 
And he goes, oh, we have a team at uh, uh, sport. I know nothing about American sport. He said, we have a team at something called the Daytona 500. I went, oh, OK. I said, what is that? I said rather foolishly. He said, oh, it's a motor racing. I said, oh, that sounds fun. And so I took his name and I said, oh, I'll call you back. And his name was Richard Petty. And I found out later that I had basically had Richard Petty on the phone asking me to go and cook for him down at the Daytona 500, which I did, which was great fun and to feed his crew. And then sat next to Richard Petty watching the Daytona 500, which was an incredible experience, even though I knew nothing about what was going on. Uh, but what, what all of this has done is it's me meant that I have been now to over 100 countries around the world. Uh, I've been to every state in the United States, um, which is really 50 countries in one. As we all know, when you travel around, such an amazing country with such astonishing food right now. Uh, and that's informed the way that I cook. So a lot of my inspiration is from all the dishes that I try around the world. And that's really what I wanted to bring home to you today. Uh, when I come to talk about sous vide kind of specifically. Um, I also write articles. So uh, again, Jason mentioned, so I write for a number of our art articles for around the world. You know, this is one that I've just written now about some time recently in Cyprus, looking at the culinary landscape there. Cyprus, you may or may not know, is the place where halloumi cheese was first kind of discovered or created. And so then it moved to Greece and around the world. But Cyprus is a wonderful place. So this is just some of the articles that I write. But again, what this means is I'm constantly traveling around the world, constantly making notes, constantly doing recipes. And if you do follow me on any and I'll give you my links at the end, any of my social media, uh, you will see the recipes. And I'm always posting links to them on my website and on my newsletter. So if you're interested in those, go to simonmajumda.com and uh, sign up for my newsletter. And I will send you a new recipe every month from around the world or you know, the things that are inspiring me. And also, you know, I think the way that I'm known mostly, obviously, on Food Network is as a judge, sometimes as a slightly mean judge. Uh, I'm a food critic for Time Out LA. So that means, obviously, pre-pandemic, I was probably eating out about four or five times a week at different restaurants, uh, trying to find out. Uh, the best food that was on offer in Los Angeles, which is obviously a very vibrant town with huge communities from the Philippines, from India, from Thailand, from Korea. And so really finding out a lot about food. And again, that just informs my passion for food around the world right now. This is, you know, we can get quite isolated here in the United States. And when I get the opportunity to travel around the world, this is what makes me really genuinely excited. Um, so I write a lot for Time Out, and these are some of the restaurants that uh, I noticed that two of these on here, I'm going to have to change them during to COVID have closed. So I might have to change my slide here, but uh, it's a it's not a bad job to have. And we mentioned earlier, and this is something that I'm actually going to be doing uh, an episode on sous vide. I'm currently writing season seven of my food history podcast. The previous episodes have been things on the last meal served on the Titanic, the history of gin, the history of Escoffier. Uh, we've done uh, the history of food in the Civil War. We've done military rations. So all kinds of interesting things. So if you've got great ideas, do let me know. I'm currently writing the history of uh, biography of Julia Child for one of them. And I'm also doing uh, some of the gentleman, James Beard, I'm writing about right now. But one of the episodes I'm going to be doing for the next season is actually on the history of sous vide which I think is a really fascinating one. And so I've just been doing some initial study on that. And it is a great history if you get chance going back to the days when they these things would cost you many thousands of dollars to have a sous vide machine, not the $75 you can buy at Walmart these days. And it's called Eat My Globe. So do go and check that out. Um, and what, what all of this has done is this kind of, hopefully this intellectual curiosity has brought me to where I am with sous vide. Uh, Mike and I have chatted quite a lot about this over the years. And uh, I was hopefully going to come down and join you when we were going to do a live event. But I'm glad that I'm able to do this now. And what that means is this is my motto. This is what I do with my life. Uh, I go everywhere. I eat everything. This is how I sign all my books. Go everywhere, eat everything. This is what I will have on my uh Tombstone, I think. He went everywhere. He ate everything when that finally comes around, hopefully in a long time to come. Um, but that means that I travel literally all over the world. You know, here you can see me, obviously, in Paris. 
uh, in front of the Parthenon in Greece. Uh, this is in Yangon in uh, Burma, which is uh, Myanmar now, which is uh, obviously rather blighted right now in the middle of a coup, but uh, where I had some of the best food I've eaten anywhere in the world. Uh, here's me in Petra uh, in front of the treasury house on the, the walk in Petra in Jordan. Uh, here's me in Easter Island, and I can hear some of you laughing and saying I look too much like the statues in Easter Island. Um, it's the ears that do it. I think most people recognize me because of my ears before they do anything else, maybe my accent. So in Easter Island, here I am at the Tsukiji fish market in Tokyo. Uh, one of the tuners behind us, I think it's the second one in, uh, that fish sold for a million dollars. So uh, they sell for a great amount of money. And you'll see they're all flash frozen out at sea and brought in. Uh, actually, by law, all of your fish for sushi is going to be flash frozen to kill off the parasites. Here I am in Azerbaijan at a place where they sell the, one of the great caviar sales markets, where they pour you tea and sell you caviar at many thousands of dollars a time. And here I am in Israel. So a lot of great adventures. But again, what that does, here I am at a spice market in Zanzibar. Uh, that's cloves that you've got there. Those are actual raw cloves. And here I am in Thailand. So that story is, again, to bring all of that home, the reason I wanted to share that with you is that really created what I wanted to talk to you about today. And what I, what I did is I set myself a challenge with Mike's approval is to look at 10 of the dishes that have really kind of moved me most when I've eaten them abroad, I've, I've really enjoyed, and to see how they might work using you know, sous vide as a method. Uh, and I hadn't done any of these dishes before. So like everybody else out there, you know, yes, I'm a cook and I'm a professional cook and I'm doing what I do, uh, but there were many interpretations of this. So although you will see the final dish where I was very happy with it, there were lots of changes in time, there were lots of changes you know, with temperature, there were lots of changes with types of protein that I wanted to do this with. And the reason I mention that a lot is we, we we watch, you know, a lot of these incredible chefs on TV or when I'm cooking at events and people think that we're kind of faultless. And part of it, I think, for all of us is we all make mistakes. We all, trust me, we all, even the very, very best chefs that I know out there make mistakes so even when i did this it's, it's just although hopefully the pictures now look very attractive i want you to know that there was quite a journey on the way to doing this um and i'm happy as we go through these dishes uh, i'll leave up the recipes which i've printed on here and i know uh, mike is going to send this out to you if you want to copy the recipes please feel free to use them i'm a big believer that uh, recipes are meant to be shared unless there's something proprietary you know for your business um, I genuinely believe recipes are meant to be shared. So I would love to know if you use these. I'd love for you to let me know if you try them. If you have any improvements on them, I'm not territorial about it. I want to learn from you kind of experts on sous vide too. So please don't worry about that. Um, so and do ask me any questions as we're going through as well. And I know we're going to allow some time at the end for some questions as well. And you can ask me about anything. You can ask me about the Food Network. You can ask me about my writing. Ask me about the dishes in particular. So we'll start off just because I wanted to touch on the garlic issue. That's something I know all of you know as uh, sous vide people. The, you know, the kind of issue you sometimes have with garlic when you're cooking to a lower temperature. I took lots of different approaches here. Sometimes I use garlic powder. Sometimes I roasted garlic separately and mix that into things before I put it in to the dish. Uh, sometimes I did use raw garlic where I was going to be purging and I wasn't going to be using the garlic in the finished dish. Uh, so I took lots of approaches here. And I'd love to know what approaches you take. Perhaps we can do that in the Q&A uh, because this was, again, a journey for me, finding out how to use garlic. So many of these dishes, particularly when we're going to Asia, particularly when we're going into certain other areas, uh, I'm using a lot of garlic. So I just, you know, I'd love to have that discussion and find out more from you about it. So let's start off and I'll tell you some of the stories about this. Um, this is congee, which uh, traditionally is a breakfast dish in China. So this is a rice porridge. In this case, it's cooked. Uh, you can see on the right dried shrimp that I rehydrated using fish sauce and a little bit of boiling water. Uh, so they plump up. And then I use the broth in the stock that I use to make the rice. 
Uh, so this is a short grain rice. I used a little bit of chicken stock, the fish broth. On the left hand side, you'll see uh, deep fried garlic and ginger that I use with a little uh, soy sauce and sesame oil to flavor it. Uh, going on to the recipe here, you can see there. Uh, so I use the short grain rice. You want something that's going to plump up. You want something that's going to have to really soak in those juices. So I did this for two hours at 190 degrees. I tried it a lot uh, longer. It kind of broke down without any kind of uh, benefit at all. So I two hours worked absolutely right here. Um, what I did with this is I wanted to really add flavor into the rice. <laughs> So I used an old school technique, obviously with a more modern technique like sous vide. So I created a bouquet garni or a wrap with cheesecloth into which I stuffed the star anise, Sichuan chili, Sichuan peppercorns. It's not really a peppercorn, it's an ash berry, but it's that thing that gives you a numbing of the mouth, a little cinnamon, bay leaf, put them in the cheesecloth, put them in my sous vide bag. The key with this and the key with all rice, if you're cooking rice at home, whether you're using a rice cooker or whether you're cooking on the stove, always, 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 and this is something my Indian grandmother always told me, practically beat into me, rinse and drain it three times in water. Then you can leave it to soak for a little while as well. That's going to get all of the excess starch out. So it will stop it being gummy. Uh, so you rinse and drain it, place the rice in the sous vide bag. I use the chicken stock, a little bit of that fish broth that I got out of uh, the, uh, the dried shrimp. Um, and then just cooked for two hours. So then when that came out, it, the, the texture, I have to say, reminded me of being in China. So I ate this, you know, the most remarkable places where you find the best food. This was actually at a train station, Chengdu train station, and they serve it in plastic bowls, which they layer with like shrink wrap so they don't have to clean the bowls all the time because it's a street stall and you just eat it with uh, you carry around your own disposable chopsticks and you just eat it there and spoon it up. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is one of the most nourishing, delicious dishes. And I had, you know, you can have it for breakfast. You can have it anytime. Uh, and for me, the moment I eat this, it's I'm a great believer for those of you who've read Proust, that uh, he talks about eating a madeleine and he writes a whole book about eat, taking one bite out of a madeleine biscuit. And it immediately brings back a whole book's worth of memories. So when I taste this, I'm immediately back in Chengdu, China. And this recipe is the one where I've got closest to it. So again, you can screen grab or we'll send this out to you, but do enjoy. Definitely want to be uh, to give a go to. Then I moved on when we moved from China, I went to Taiwan. This is one of those great nourishing dishes. This is one that took me a lot of time to get the, te the texture right, to get everything right for the uh, dish. So Taiwan is known for its beef noodle soup, uh, and particularly they use beef shanks, beef shanks on the bone. So you're really going to get the broth that this creates is extraordinary. Uh, so you're going to create this with some scallions. You're going to use black cardamom, which is the, if you've seen cardamom, normally you'll see the green one that's been, uh, kind of uh, opened out from the black. This one, you want the black. You want powerful flavors going in here. Uh, this was 20 hours I found at 167. So I went up and down in temperature. I went up and down in time. Uh, but this is where I found that the meat still held some consistency. It still had not a chew, but a little texture to it. Part of, I think, as a judge, when I'm judging food in the United States, we cook our food too much in the United States and things tend to be mushy. When you travel around the world, what you'll find is a lot more use of textures uh, than we get in the United States. And this is one of those dishes where you will want a little bit of a bite to your beef shank. You don't want it kind of falling off the bone like you would look at a, a, a spare rib. You want a little bit of a taste to this. Um, with the cinnamon stick, with the star anise. Now, I didn't put this into a bouquet garni because what I took the when I kind of purged the bag, I use that to make this broth and the flavors in this with all of those um, spices that I strained out was just, even though I say so myself, and yeah, it was, was exquisite and again, really reminded me of my times in Taiwan. So it's really deep. And then you just use it with simple noodles, some green, uh, some greens in there. I use some bok choy. You could use whatever you wanted. You could use spinach, Chinese broccoli, whatever you wanted. Um, but those, just slicing those uh, beef shanks at the end 
is incredible. They have a beautiful color to them. You can see the color that they just took on there. There's no searing there. This was all in the 20 hours that we got in there. Um, give the, I mean, give this a try. What was interesting for me doing this dish was that I'm never at home normally for 24 hours at a time. Uh, I'm usually traveling for filming and writing and all of the above. But during the pandemic, I was at home where I could actually spend two or three days having something in a sous vide. So uh, I want to thank Mike for asking me to do that because it got me to play around with it. Now we go, we're talking about textures. You know, I'm cooking today, the dinner that I'm cooking, apart from the fact I'm actually sous videing 24 ribeyes downstairs right now. Uh, I'm actually cooking porchetta. And with that, of course, porchetta is going to have crunchy skin. It's going to have that pork belly crunch that we all love in the United States. In Japan, they want they like crunchy, but they also like melting. They like meat that will dissolve in the mouth. If you've never tried Cancuni, so this is a braised pork belly. So you're going to braise this with dashi, show you the recipe. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this was 12 hours. It's a fairly long time here. Uh, just the thick, chunky, one-inch cut pork belly with the fat and the skin on it. That's the key. You need to have that so it holds its shape. Just try and get it with the fat and the skin. Now, that can be quite hard sometimes because a lot of the skin is taken off pork belly in the United States because it goes into... Uh, the Latin American markets, it goes to make chicharron, it goes, so they will often take it out off. Um, but this is this dish when you make this. So you're going to add in a little bit of ginger, the dashi stock, which you can buy at any Japanese supermarket or Asian supermarket or online. Sake works very well. So you can imagine the flavors. Those of you who like sake, I'm sure most of you do. Mirin the, and rice wine vinegar, a little bit of brown sugar. So the sweetness that you're going to get here. So it's a little sweet and savory. Uh, works really, really well. A little bit of chili pepper. Now, it's not going to be brutal because it's really an accent to it. The chili pepper wakes up the, wakes up your taste buds. And you use this and it goes through. And I think this works really well. What you get, though, is something that literally dissolves in your mouth like a kind of sweet pork candy. And they serve this in pubs. And they'll put a little plate in front of you while you're having your beer. And it, it really helps you go, go and get more beer. So do try this. Try it as a, as a drinking food with some beer. And I think you'll really enjoy it. Now, those of you who know my background know that I'm from India. My father was from Calcutta. Indian food is probably my biggest passion. But I wanted to try something different here with some fish. Like mackerel, to me, is one of the most amazing kind of uh, fish. It holds together really well, so it works really well in sous vide. This is from Kerala. From It's a southern state, so this is where I use curry leaves. I use coconut milk uh, to get the flavors in here. I use a little tamarind, which is what we use for sourness there. And what I talk about here is the masala. So this is what's called a bangdiachi human masala. Masala means spice mix. Uh, so if you see the word garam masala, that basically means hot spice mix. And everyone has their own version of garam masala. But each dish that you would see in India would have their own masala mix. So you can see the flavors here, coriander, white mustard seed, ground turmeric, white pepper, cloves, Kashmiri chilies you can find in any Indian supermarket. Those are known not to give heat, they're really to give color. Uh, and a beautiful flavor, but not too much heat. A little bit of fenugreek seed. Now, the key with this is you toast, dry toast all your ingredients when you make Indian food. So dry toast all those spices before you grind them. What that does is brings out the oils from inside the spices and the flavor of your curries, whatever type of curry you're making, uh, will always be better. And I do recommend, you know, we've got serious cooks here. So I do recommend you don't buy pre-made powders buy the individual seeds in small packets and dry, uh, dry toast them, grind them as needed for all the different ones. And the difference to your flavors will be incredible. Uh, using serrano chili uh, in there, in julienne, and that thickened through, and the coconut milk. So, and the, and the curry leaves you'll find in any supermarket, so uh, in any Indian supermarket, little green leaves. They look almost like a mint leaf. And they give that deep, rich curry flavor, that deep flavor that you'll know if you're a fan of curry. Uh, but what I found was the sauce came together really beautifully with this just in a short time. It was one hour. You don't want to overcook this. You don't want your fish to look like you've got medieval with it. You want to kind of 
enjoy the flavors as you go through. And so this really came through. Um, I was really thrilled with this, but if you don't like uh, mackerel, you could do this with any firm white fish. I do a dish later on, you'll see with halibut. Uh, this would work really well with cod. Uh, this, this would even work well with catfish. And I've made catfish curries using this before. Works really, really well. And I think fish is something that I found interesting using sous vide because it's a shorter time period. Uh, but I was really thrilled with the way that this turned out. So I hope that you give some of these a try. This, <coughs> excuse me, this meal is bringing back probably one of the most hospitable uh, meals I've ever had. I was in Senegal in the capital, Dhaka. I met a gentleman there and he invited me to have dinner with him and his family one night. And they made this dish, poulet yassa. So this is a combination of, you know, kind of French history because it was a French colony and African history uh, in Senegal. And this is a dish using a little bit of vinegar, olives, parsley. So it looks almost like a French dish. Uh, so I seared this on top, uh, the chicken. And then before I put it in, I got a little bit of color on it first. You don't want this to be roasted. And then you make this beautiful gravy, again, purging the sauce, that you, the broth that's been created inside. So you can see that the juice is in there. The lemon juice gives it a tang, which again is comes from the French influence. But what I remember about this meal, and it looked very similar to the one that I've got there, is the mother and the father. You sit, sit eating this communally on the floor in a big pot, and you each have a plate in front of you, and you can have some bread and other things. But what they did is they constantly took the best part of all the meal, the best bit of chicken, the best sauce, the best whatever, and put that on my plate. And what it was, was I was the honored guest. And they brought this to me and kind of served it to me. And so I remember this dish as being one of those things that I just remember as much as the food, which was gorgeous, just remembering the hospitality of the people, which you find going all around the world, you just find incredible hospitality. And I want to try and recreate that in some of the ways that I cook my food. The other thing to mention here is Scotch bonnet peppers. Now, they can be a little hard to find in the United States. And often, and I've done it in another recipe, I've gone, well, you can replace with a habanero. What I should say is probably double the amount of habanero because the Scoville units of habanero is about half of that of Scotch bonnet. Scotch bonnets are really fiery, those of you who've touched them. Uh, and what you do is you kind of put them in minced or you can put them in whole um, and they will just seep their juices into there without getting too much heat. But Scotch bonnet is important for this if you can get it. Uh, so do do look them up, order them online. Uh, they're going to be particularly important for another dish coming up. In fact, vital for another dish coming up. So do give this a a, a try. African food or I mean, it's obviously a huge continent. There's lots of different cuisines there uh, with the many different countries there. Uh, but it's an area that we don't look to as much now, maybe Ethiopian a little bit. Uh, but we don't really think about so many of the cuisines there. But there's some incredible cuisines. And Senegal, with that French influence, I think is one of the greatest in the world. <coughs> Morocco. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in Morocco. And this was my longest, I think, my longest sous vide kind of experiment. And tagines are something, tagines traditionally are made in a pot, uh, that very famous tagine pot. And they're made that way because uh, they don't have much water. You know, it was a dry country. And so this would retain the water. Obviously, I don't have that problem in the sous vide bag. Um, you can see the beautiful color. So I did sear off the lamb shanks. The key here, and I've got a recipe here on top called Ras El Hamout. Now that's... Uh, Moroccan or Arabic rather for top of the shop or top shelf. So when you went into a spice mix, uh, you know, a spice cellar, you would go, I want the best. I want the top of the shop. And so they would go up to the top where they had all the very expensive spices so people couldn't reach up and steal them. And they will get them from there using the best cumin seeds, the best black pepper. And this is where I really suggest you go and make a big batch of this because you can use this for rubbing on lamb shanks. You rub this on a roast chicken. You rub it on fish. This is one of the great spice combinations. So I rubbed this onto the lamb shanks and I left them for two or three hours, four hours, and just let them uh, really seep into the meat. And then I seared the meat, seared the onion, seared the garlic before I put it into my sous vide bag with everything else here. And you can see it's got 
chickpeas and tomatoes and prunes and dates and lemons and preserved lemons. So what you're getting in this 48 hour period of sous vide here is just this extraordinary combination of flavors. And the moment you open it, it smells like you're in you know, Morocco and it's just those flavors. So really, really try and get the best ingredients you can for this one, particularly the lamb shanks. You can see these were beautifully meaty. Um, and the preserved lemons, you can make your own preserved lemons at home just with salt and lemon and just cut them up into chunks and put them in a thing with, a, you know, a sanitized jar with salt in the sun and keep turning it. And in about three weeks, you've got the best preserved lemons you'll ever have. So try making those as well. Uh, but this worked so well, 48 hours. This was where the meat practically fell apart when you looked at it. It was so soft and juicy and really delicious. And this was the other dish. Jamaica is one of my favorite countries to visit. Uh, I'm a great fan of old school reggae from the 1970s. I'm a great fan of cricket. And obviously in England and Jamaica, they play a lot of cricket. And I'm a great fan of this dish. Now, this dish was created by Indians coming to uh, Jamaica um, after the end of slavery. Uh, a lot of the places in uh, the Caribbean Obviously, the slaves weren't working on the plantations. And so they brought in indentured servants from India and they brought with them their curries. And then they used local ingredients to try and create dishes. And goat was a big one that they used in Jamaica. Uh, they also, as you will see from my recipe, they used, <coughs> excuse me, they used uh, Jamaican curry powder that they made there using all spice berries. And that's the key ingredient for this when you make curry goat. You've got to find allspice. It was called allspice because Christopher Columbus tasted it there and he thought that it tasted a little bit of cumin, a little bit of this, a little, and he thought it tasted like all the spices. So they kind of talked about it in that way. Um, but you make this Jamaican curry powder. Again, I would make this, I make, I make two or three of these uh, meals worth and I'll use this on a roast chicken, kind of making a jerk chicken works very, very well. Uh, and you should really, really get hold of those Scotch bonnet peppers for this. It's This is all about a little bit of spice in there. So we have a saying, and we're all grown ups in England, uh, in, in um, the sous vide association rather, we call this in England, we call this Johnny Cash food, because tomorrow you'll have a burning ring of fire. Nice and spicy. Try making this goat meat. You will find halal goat meat at most Asian uh, butchers. They will have this there. Do try it. You can make it with lamb, good lamb chunks as well. Get it on the bone. You really want to have the flavor. And what I found with that 24 hour sous vide period is that I got so much flavor coming out of the bone. The broth that you got with this was really extraordinary. Um, I, I will say with all of these dishes now, I will never go back to cooking these any other way than doing it with sous vide. I will do these all the time in this way. So again, great thanks to Mike and Jason for putting me through the challenge. This is uh, another fish dish. So this was from Argentina where they use the chimichurri, uh, which is, uh, you know, parsley and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, parsley, uh, I'm using some cilantro, you can use shallots, red onion, um, a little pepper in there, a little lime juice. So this is nice and spicy and you serve it with this thick, meaty halibut steak. And what that means is that by cooking it only 45 minutes, so you're barely kind of like showing it the sous vide, but it means that it breaks apart. And you can see in the picture here, it breaks apart into a little flake. And so the meat really holds on on this. And it means that in that sous vide, though, the spicing that you put on this just goes into the meat really beautifully. So I just use salt, white pepper, paprika, garlic powder, olive oil, mix that into the fish and you marinate it. This is a classic Argentinian way of serving a, a fish. And I think it's a really good one. And then we're coming to, towards the end of this. This is one of my favorites. This was a lamb shank. Cleftico. Cleftico was usually cooked. Excuse, I'm going to take a drink. Excuse me. Uh, thank you. Uh, bearing with me. Um, so cleftico was traditionally cooked in Cyprus and in Greece. And they would have communal ovens. They would have a baker's oven in the middle of the town because not everyone had their own stove. And what they would do is they would take in the lamb shanks. They would take in the potatoes, all the flavors. They'd put it in a pot. 
And once the oven had been emptied of the bread, and as the heat in the oven was declining, which it took 24 hours to do, they would leave that in there all day. And then the women would take it in in the day and the men would collect it coming home at night and bring it back and it would all be cooked. Obviously, I've tried to recreate that using this with um, the, using this with the sous vide, which worked really, really well. And what you do want here is you really want that meat to fall off the bone. And you can see how it's seeped down the bone. So you can practically pick up the lamb shank and just use it with your hands and just eat, the, which we did use, eat it, eat it from the bone. Um, using all of the other things that I put in there on the bottom, obviously with potatoes and stuff to serve it with, just works really, really well. So you've got the whole recipe there. This is 24 hours. You could do this longer. I did a 48 hour one, which was a little bit too much for me, but I thought this one worked really well. You do want to just thicken the sauce a little bit there to use for your broth. And I used a burmarie, which is equal parts of flour and butter, just uh, whisking that into your sauce. Coming towards France, duck confit is something that a lot of you will probably know doing sous vide, cooking it with fat. So rather than just do a duck confit as a thing, I broke it down to make this salad. It works in this really fantastic salad, which I, you know, I had this in Paris in a restaurant and I've been trying to recreate it. I actually found the sous vide that I did and gave me the texture that I've never been able to get before. So I cooked it, you know, in the fat, uh, inside the sous vide, uh, and it worked well. The texture was just beautiful. And then I broke it down to make this salad using green. You can use whatever greens you like. Um, but what it showed me is really there, there's no limits to what I could do with my sous vide. And I'd never done it this way before. And again, as I said before, all of my uh, cooking like this, my sous vide, I'll be using this to make duck confit from now on. The whole recipe is there. We'll share that with you. Do give it a try. So those are my dishes there. I'll stop sharing there. These are my contacts. If anyone wants to make any of these dishes, anyone wants to email me, text me, or, you know, come on Twitter as a direct message, ask any questions about these, I would love, love, love to chat to you about them. Um, I'm always happy to see you know, what you try about them. I'll answer any questions. Um, but I hope that's given you just some things to play with. I shall come on to my uh, picture here so you can see me again. Uh, and I hope that you uh, have enjoyed that, seeing some of those, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. We had some great questions in the, the chat, some great discussion over there, Simon, that seeing your recipes and just the variety of things that you do, it's amazing to see sous vide apply to so many different cuisines from around the globe. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to put this presentation together. It was amazing, and I can't wait to dive into some of the questions people asked here. I think the most important one is from uh, Louis G. He said, how do you stay so thin? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I wish I was on sponsorship. I wear a Fitbit and I walk 20,000 steps a day without fail. And uh, if I, if I, I've, I've managed, I've actually lost 50 pounds in the last kind of three or four years. So uh, I was getting, I was getting, I was getting to the point where I had my own zip code. I was getting so big. So <laughs> I, uh, I basically decided I needed to do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. A lot of walking. That makes sense. Uh, Mike wanted to know what was the hardest of the the most challenging of the dishes to adapt. Um, the fish dishes, um, because you know I, I'm a man with bananas for fingers, and you know I'm not a gentle man. And um, those are dishes where you've got to you know putting things into sous vide and leaving them for 48 hours is there's a process and it's technical, but you kind of don't have to worry about it too much. You just let. When you have to cook fish, which is very gentle, you know, and you want it to that point where it flakes like the halibut that we did, 45 minutes. So you've got to really keep an eye on it. Um, so I found the fish dishes the most challenging. Excuse me, I'm coughing. I don't know why I'm coughing so much. Um, <laughs> so much excitement of being at the, the ISVA sous vide summit. We get that a lot from our guests. I'm quite right, too. This is, and I say, as I said earlier, uh, you know, I was thrilled that you invited me to do that when I came up with this idea and you guys agreed that it was a fun one. Um, it was interesting because I had lots of other dishes. I did some other dishes as well that I had out there and 
uh, did all kinds of things. But what I hope I showed here is, you know, we think about, just as I'm doing at the dinner tonight, um, you know, steaks. And I will never cook a steak another way. I, I always see her afterwards. So, you know, I do 129 degrees, three hours, finish on the grill. And it's I get the perfect steak every time, and everyone everyone at the dinner, someone goes away the next day and buys a sous vide machine and goes <laughs> and cooks with it. Um, so we think from that point of view. But what I wanted to do was to see these amazing dishes around the world, and actually see if it like some dishes I did, and quite frankly, the sous vide didn't improve it mm -hmm. because it's a machine. You know, it can do some things really well and something. But with all of these things like the Cleftico that I showed there, you know, and, and I'm I'm not being immodest in saying when you look at the picture, it looks lovely. And that's the sous vide that does that. That's not me. That's the piece of machinery. That's what did that. And so I, I'm genuinely saying that I will never cook those dishes any other way again. I love that. It, I agree that sous vide is just a tool in your cook's tool belt and some things it does great at some things other things are better at accomplishing what you want uh, lauren had a question she says she struggled with sous vide fish you mentioned those were the most challenging dishes for you um what are some tips you have for lauren to maybe make sure her fish doesn't get mushy make sure that it comes out the way that you might want well i think there's two sides to that one is obviously really getting good fish uh, so I think the key is uh, so and, and choosing the right kind of fish. So there are fish, you know, sal salmon is one thing. I'm not fond of salmon done in the sous vide personally. I think it breaks down too quickly. But something meaty, something like a cod, something that's got a bit of structure to it would use. Um, I would be very, very gentle with it, not into uh, put a little bit of salt, pepper, bit of spicing, lemon, whatever you're going to do and then just do it for a very short amount of time. And I think it's one of those, it's you kind of almost short enough that you watch the pot. Um, with fish, I think it's, uh, it's, you know, you've got to be seafood the same. Um, it works really, really well, but you've got to keep an eye on it. You, you can't go off and do other things when you're doing this, which you can absolutely do uh, with other, um, you know, like meat dishes or something that you're cooking for 72 hours or something. Obviously, you're going to go and do other things. Fish, never stand by the pot and watch it. Yeah, I feel like most sous vide foods, you have about like a 30 to 40% variance in time. But with fish, yeah. you're cooking 40 minutes. So 30% of that is like 12 minutes. It's not that yeah. uh, it's not extreme like a lot of the other things. Uh, one thing a lot of people struggle with, too, is that if you use a hard like chamber seal on fish that can destroy the texture of some types of fish as well. So if you do have a professional yeah. chambered vacuum sealer, you know, I almost never seal my fish. I just uh, drape it over the edge and, or use a Ziploc bag, something like that. Will definitely work. Uh, Eric was wondering, do you remove the silver skin first on the lamb shank? Uh, so I didn't, um, but, but uh, what I found was it kind of basically I peeled it off. But also when you're cooking for something that long, it doesn't break down as much, but you can peel it off very easily. Again, what I the reason I kept the silver skin on, my thought, and I'm not sure it's even a good scientific thought, was I just wanted to hold a bit of structure with it because it just holds it on there. Uh, but then I took it off afterwards. And what was that? Do you remember off the top what that was cooked at temperature-wise? Roundabout? Uh, oh. I can have, I can tell you very, which that this was the Cleftico was, um, I can tell you now that was 155 for 24 hours. That makes sense. Cause that meat would start at that temperature. It'd start to really start breaking apart. So having that silver skin on could hold it together. And it's I've definitely done together. like, done like pork shoulder or something and trying to get it out of the bag. It's almost falling apart. Cause it's too, too tender. And if you, if you look at the, food. if you look at the picture there, it held together but was literally, you had it like a lamb shank lollipop, basically, at the end. That's awesome. Uh, Stephen said, you mentioned that um, sous vide wasn't great for some dishes. It didn't improve them. What was an example of a dish that that was true for? Well, I was, so one of the dishes where I failed miserably, you know, uh, kind of shriveled like a salted slug, I was so, um, <laughs> was, um, there's a dish from Spain called gambus pilpil, which is a shrimp dish that's cooked with olive oil, parsley, red peppers, wonderful dish. 
And so I cooked two together. I cooked one in the sous vide and I cooked one uh, on, in the pan. And uh, the sous vide one was dreadful. Um, it just didn't, they became rubbery, even though I had my timings right. And so they were not great. Whereas my timing for cooking this in the pan, it worked much better. And I have a recipe for gambas built along my website and people should go and try it. And I, maybe I just did something terribly wrong. And like I said, you know, I'm fully uh, uh, willing to say that I've made lots of mistakes because I'm new to this. Um, that's why it was such a great experiment. Awesome. Uh, Britt wanted to know, can you substitute pork shanks in the recipes that used lamb shanks? You absolutely could. Uh, your timings, I think, will be a little uh, longer for the pork shanks, uh, but they will absolutely work in there. You, traditionally, obviously, you wouldn't necessarily have that in uh, tagine because uh, that's a, it's a Muslim, it's an Arabic dish, it's a Muslim dish, so they wouldn't be using pork. Uh, beef shanks would work very well in there too. Um, you can also do that tagine with chicken in there as well. Obviously, that'll alter your timings. Uh, Lisa Keys, who did her uh, sticky pudding uh, collaboration with oh, you. Oh, of course. Is, yes, fantastic. Yes, that's going to be a demo. I think it's either later today or tomorrow. It's going to be a demo at the presentation. Um, she it was brilliant. She did an amazing, amazing job. Yeah, Lisa does a great job. And I knew when you talked about that during our, uh, I think it was the Exploring Sous Vide interview, I was like, Lisa is the person that will configure it out. If someone can figure it out, she's the one. Yeah. <laughs> she wanted to know, what is your next challenge? Well, my next, cha <laughs> I have lots of challenges. So when we can get out walking again, my wife and I are planning to take six months to walk as much of the spice trail from China across into Europe and down to Africa as much as we can. So that'll be something we're going to be doing. In food terms, uh, I noticed someone asked a question about game meat. Now, what I'm uh, and I I love you know good game meat, elk, by you know bison, uh, yeah, whatever we could get. Um, people go hunting, so I want to start doing uh, some dishes with those. And actually, one of the other things that I'm thinking of sous vide today, and I haven't I've decided yet, is I'm making uh, satay with some elk uh, okay. for someone. And I'm going to, so I basically have made a peanut sauce, marinating it, and I'm thinking of cooking that in, on skewers in the sous vide and then just grilling it at the end. So um, I really like uh, cooking with those. I The other thing that I like, which is not to everyone's taste, is I love cooking with offal. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really love kidneys. And I've I come up from, you know, Welsh grandmother who lived through the Second World War, who kicked with hearts and kidneys. And, and I love trying those um i have not done a lot of those in sous vide i'm very very almost none and i'd be really interested to see how they take on because they're all about texture i know mike's done a lot of sous vide uh game meats and chef justice stewart from gourmet deconstructed does a lot of game as well and loves it uh tim asked about like ostrich with uh, lean meat and i've heard that sous vide is great for some of those leaner meats that if you overcook them, they get tough so fast that with sous vide, you eliminate that possibility. So they stay a little tender, a little bit longer, and you have a lot more leeway. And what I would do with things like ostrich or very lean venison is I would uh, either thread them with bacon fat, kind of what they used to call larding in the day. And then when you cook them, that fat will, in the sous vide, that fat will kind of go into the flavors as well and give you a, a, an extra juiciness in there. How do you thread them with bacon fat? That sounds amazing. Well, you, so you take off the fat from the bacon, literally. You cut it into thin strips and you buy, you can buy them online. It's called a larding needle. They used to do it in, you could do it with chicken as well. You thread, they used to do this in Victorian times. You get bacon fat and you thread through the breast, almost like darning. It's a darning needle and you wrap it. And that fat basically then melts into the meat as it's cooking. <coughs> That sounds like something I need to explore more. Anything that can get more bacon into my diet, I think, is a is a good thing. My doctor might well, not agree, but it definitely gets the flavor in there. And it's not; it just is using, you know, it comes from a time when people were using uh, animal products for, rather than olive oils. They were using butter, and and I'm a great believer in those as well. Really good. I make my own butter at home, and then I use that in my cooking as much as I'm using anything else. How long does it take to make butter at home? I've never made 
butter myself. Oh, oh super, super quick. So basically heavy cream in a KitchenAid. You keep whisking it until it goes past being whipped cream. It separates into uh, buttermilk and, uh, and butter. You then get an ice, a uh, big bowl of iced water and you squeeze the butter in there until you get rid of all the buttermilk inside. Keep doing that. It's not good for your hands, but you do it for four or five minutes. Get rid of all the buttermilk. Dry, uh, then mix some salt, massage the salt into it as much as you want to, for your flavors. And then just pat it in some parchment paper and pop it in the fridge. And so I, I tend to do that once a week. I love that. I'm going to have to add that to my things to explore uh, this once my wife starts uh, her busy schedule uh, in a week or two. I'll have a lot more free time on my hands. <laughs> Mike, and I do. I, oh, oops. go ahead. No, I do think that someone mentioned. Uh, bake. I'm a great believer of if I roast a chicken, if I roast something, whatever, like the 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 fat, I keep. And so, so if I'm doing say a lamb chop, I will often rub it with a little bit of chicken fat. Uh, that I've had from a roast chicken, and then I'll either fry it or I'll put it in my sous vide. Or it, it, so anything that's going to give those kind of roasted flavors, their delivery systems for flavor. The key is that you have the best meats. So if you if you've got a bad chicken, you know, uh, processed chicken, that's not going to be good. It's going to have no flavor anyway. But if you buy a good organic chicken and you get all those juices off it, don't waste those. Those are amazing to put into fried rice, a little bit of chicken fat in the bottom of a fried rice, a little bit of chicken fat in, in the bottom of anything that, you know, where you're going to have flavor. Add it into your onions if you're cooking a soup when you're frying the onions and you add a bit of chicken fat in there like the schmaltz. What it's doing is I have a saying, no flavors left behind. And that's what I do with this. I mean, every flavor you find a chance in there. Raphael asked, uh, considering the quality of the heavy cream for making butter, what type do you prefer using? Well, I just buy, quite frankly, a good quality heavy cream. I buy from like Whole Foods or from Trader Joe's or something. So you don't need to go, you know, if you, the, obviously the, the fat content will alter the texture of it, but uh, go and try one of the good ones from Trader, a good organic one from Trader Joe's or Whole Foods would work really well. Well, Simon, I appreciate you coming on, putting together such an amazing keynote speech. Uh, is, the recipes are great. The presentation of them was great. And as always, it was wonderful having a Q&A with you and being able to learn a little bit more from your expertise. Mike and I, it means so much to us that you came here and spent, you know, took time out. And for everyone listening, like Mike and I work with a lot of people that are big deals. You know, we've had uh, champions award winners that are Michelin star chefs. We have people on our podcast that are chefs that are on TV. And Simon's been one of the nicest people we have ever worked Aww. with. He was gracious Thank throughout you. the entire time. And just, you know, if you ever want to work with a, a real professional, Simon is the person that you need to look up. So thank you, Simon. We really appreciate thank it. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And thank you for letting me come and be part of this. And, uh, now I'm going to listen to Mellow Miles and go and cook some, uh, go cook a porchetta. I've got to make bread next. My Ooh. next roll is I've got to go down and make some bread for tonight's dinner. 50 rolls. Well, make sure um, you take a picture and tag it uh, with the, uh, the sous vide summit on Instagram. That so everyone that's following along uh, the summit can see what you ended up making at the end of the day. <laughs> that will be fantastic. And if anyone um, tries any of these dishes, I know you're going to share the recipes. Please, please, please tag me. I'd love to see what people do. Oh, I love that, Simon. Thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, please give Simon some love in the comments. Um, it was great. I learned a ton. I'm sure all of you did as well. So please let him know how much you appreciated him. Simon, thank you again for coming on. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. See you again. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. I think you can leave stage. There we go. Perfect. That's close enough. <laughs> so I'm Simon was he was just great to work with. He was, you know, very responsive when Mike and I got a hold of him. As you can tell, he put a ton of time into that presentation. That was not just a sit down and, you know, do a dish that he's done before. He came up with what is that 10 recipes that he hadn't done before, exploring them, coming up with great stuff. Just an amazing individual.